Well, hello there, football friends. So on Monday evening, during the Wales GSA game, Tots, Tots and I got the chat with a very impressive young man, a rising star, Patrick Kelly. Currently at West Ham United, he got his dream move following uh, his graduation through the Coleraine FC Academy. So the Port Stewart native uh, is over in London, living his best life. A great chat with a, with a say, a very impressive young man. So listen in, I hope you enjoy it. And keep an eye out and an ear out for Patrick Kelly. Me and awesome football friends, thanks for your continued support. Keep up is with Richie and Tots. <laughs> So Patrick, thanks for getting uh, back to Tots. Obviously, he's reached out to you over Twitter. Yeah. A story to tell. You're a young man. Your your career is only in its infancy, but you've a story to tell. So we're looking forward to looking forward yeah. to hearing it. And again, uh, hopefully, we'll get a few more West Ham fans when this is all over and done, done and dusted. Yeah. So we'll let Tots uh, start start the conversation, and, and we'll just rattle through it. As you say, okay. it's it's all fun and games here. It's a bit of crack. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, we'll tell a few tales and call out a few people as as the <laughs> yeah. as the conversation rolls in. Yeah, good man. And to confirm, just in case you didn't hear about there, Patrick, you're 100 percent right. George Way is Siberian, and he's a politician yeah. now. Yeah, so that's that's, that's yeah. impressive. Um, so we'll start you off with a nice easy one. Get you a nice early first touch. Um, who was or who's your who was your favourite team growing up, and who was your Football hero. Uh, my favorite team growing up was Liverpool. I was a big Liverpool fan from like ever since I started watching football. That my mom, my mom was a Liverpool fan, so that was the main reason I supported them. And then I was scouted for the Liverpool academy and like Belfast whenever I was like eight as well. So I was always Liverpool. And then my football night that was probably still as Leo Messi. Or I like watching Eden Hazard as well growing up. Probably am too. Fantastic! What a start, Richie. Liverpool fan. Well, yeah. both of us. Yeah, Liverpool, I'm, Liverpool, I'm yeah. delighted. <laughs> Absolutely delighted. Yeah. This is going to be okay. Patrick will enjoy this. Uh, this, this is good. You know what? We'll just talk about Liverpool, will we? <laughs> well, we'll we can start the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Richie, he goes back. He's he's seen. You know, you've probably heard about the the, the, the great team of the the seventies and eighties. That's Richie. Yeah. Richie's seen them all. That's how old he is. Um, <laughs> but what, what about what about Liverpool? What about Liverpool players? Like who, who would have been your uh, I suppose your favourite Liverpool player growing up? Uh, growing up, whenever I was younger, I loved Torres and Gerrard, but like over the last few years, kind of Salah, I'm a big Firmino fan, I love Firmino. Uh, probably Salah and Firmino recently. Brilliant. Love Bobby. Yeah. Uh, and his contract's up in the summer as well, I think. Is that next summer? Yeah. Maybe this summer. Yeah, there's a couple yeah. of contracts up. I think they're trying to tie him down, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's he's been he's been really important, I think. Um Especially, you know, when when Klopp took charge, because I think it was Brendan yeah, Rodgers was wasn't it that signed him. him. Yeah. I think it was Rodgers might have signed him, but he, he just never really. I think he might have been played in the left wing. But Klopp obviously knew a, a fair bit about him from from the time in Germany and played him in that false nine, and he's kind of made that position his own. Maybe yeah, he doesn't he sco- score a whole pile of goals, but he links up the player really well and has worked great. Can't believe he's not. Fantastic. Can't believe he's not going to the World Cup. Yeah, it's big, but it just just shows you how strong Brazil is. Man, no. Yeah, I know. But and he's I in such good form. Going, I think he should be going over to Charleston, definitely. It's I been agree. very good this season. Charleston yeah. hasn't played much football either. He hasn't scored a goal in the league this season. Bobby scored like six or seven, I think. Maybe more. But they started the season really well in comparison yeah. to previous seasons, Bobby. Great to see. Well, hopefully we get the best of him, that he's well rested after the World Cup. Yeah, I suppose that's a good thing. And man, Salah both. Right, never mind, Bobby Firmino, Richie, we're, we're here. This is Keepy Uppies <laughs> with, with Patrick Kelly. Or, or PK, as, yes, as you're, Patrick Kelly. As you're known. Yeah. So, Richie, you're going to run through then the, the youth days. So. Yes, Patrick. Yes. Yeah. So, just, just from the outset, so obviously a young boy. Where did it yeah. all begin? Where, uh, right so, back. so, 
from what I, from my memory, I, I played it like a it was like a wee club called like a Bandside or Bambinos. It wasn't a team. It was just like a five aside thing at a Leisure Corey and Leisure Centre. Uh, I played there from like four to five, and then at six I joined Corey. And so I was at Corey my whole life from six up until I moved here until seventeen. So I've always been at Corey. Wow. So talk me through your your times and your your first team at Coleraine. Who was your your first team? Your first coach? Um, the coach that brought me in was Paul Wallace and Roger Dallas at like under sevens. I think whenever I was six. So I think we were playing like seven side back then. I can I can remember bits of it. I just remember playing like we always had like two games on a Saturday, and it was like yeah. uh, it was in Bally Sally and Coleraine, like the league we played in. And I just that's where it started for me, just at Coleraine. Then I just started loving football from then, and I just never really thought about leaving Coleraine. Just played with them the whole, whole youth, right, right way through. Fantastic. And any standout memories then for, in the youth days? Any trophies won? Any? Yeah, play? I think, I think Glen Tor and our age were always a lot better than everyone else, but I think towards the end we kind of caught them a bit and then we won, we, uh, under 14, we won a B League and we won a cup and then under 15 we came second in the A League and then under 16 we won the league. So uh, we won the Niffle League under 16, so. That's probably the best team mm-hmm. in the Korean. Yes, but you've been on a trajectory then for a long time from yeah, yeah, from playing grassroots football right through and then picking yeah. up the trophies on the way. Yeah. So then, obviously, a quick transition. At what age to be uh, taken into the first team squad then? Uh, so it was kind of after the first lockdown. Uh, we came back in March twenty. No, the first when was the first lockdown? March twenty twenty. Yes. And then we came back that like uh we we went back to football in, like September and then I was playing with under eighteens uh from September and then there was another lockdown after that Christmas and then once we came back from that one in like March I was still playing with under eighteens and then we played the under twenties in like an in house friendly game in like March and then I played quite well on it and I think Owen was at it and then he brought me up the show with the first team like a week after that and then I'd done quite well in the first couple of training sessions and then that was it. I was just up from, I think it was like May 2020 or 2021, 2021, I think it was. I was just up from there. Confirm your age. Squad. Confirm your age at that time, sorry. Uh, I was 16. 16, very good. Yeah. Very good. So, so reading, reading some of the, some of the resources that, that we've been checking out about you, Oren had referenced that, uh, your voice must have broke in the yeah, in the, in the yeah, over I was that always, time. Yeah, it's quite a funny story. So I was always really small growing up. Like I was always the smallest on the team. And then I was dropped from I was in the Northern Ireland setup from like nine to about fourteen. Like uh played all the underage groups there, like went in tours everywhere, played like all around Europe and tournaments and stuff, and then I like under fourteen I was dropped because I was too small. And then that was at like I think I was third year Christmas, so I was fourteen and then I didn't kind of grow until I just turned 16. And then over that lockdown, I just grew up a bit, like just got a lot taller, had a growth spurt and stuff. And then I came back and then Oren tells that story about the first time he spoke to me because he walked past me. We were training beside them. And I said hello to him and then he looked kind of shocked whenever I said it to him because he just said it sounded very different. But uh, yeah, and I was just up since that. Very good, very good. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, what position do you play? Uh, growing up, I was I was a striker from like probably I just seven to about eleven. Then I started playing a bit deeper. Uh, one one of the coaches at Corey and Andy Law started playing me more number ten. And then whenever I broke in the first team, I was playing ten the first few games, and I played wide left, wide right, and then towards the end of the season, I was playing as an eight. So I just kind of played everywhere across my field. Fantastic. And again, you're still a student of the game, being a student. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. So that 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 integration from uh, from youth level into senior level. Yeah. It seems that you took you took it in your stride, but I'm yeah. sure you had uh, your own demons just to, just to, before you put on that that shirt for the first time. Let yeah. us know where your head was whenever that arrived. It was very scary because I was a massive Korean fan. Like I've obviously playing for them since I was like six. I went through all the games and stuff. I was always doing ball boy whenever I was really young, and then me and my friends went to the games every Saturday, like whenever they were home. So. I remember when I made my debut, I was so nervous coming on. I was away to Carrick, I think, like 4th of September last season. So, because I'd been up all that summer doing pre-season and stuff, and I went away in the European game to Bosnia. I think we played Velez or something. And then I made my league debut, and I just remember being so nervous. It was just so scary coming on, because it was so different. I think the training at the start was so different as well, but I think after, like, 
a month of training. I was used to it and I was kind of like doing really well in training and stuff. But all that once helped me. Corey and like to London and stuff, so yeah, that was fine. Brilliant, brilliant. So you've matured, you've matured, matured and succeeded with with the club. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And then a quick transition then from Coleraine to where you are now. I'll let Tats uh, sort of kick on from here and ask you a few, few leading questions. I, w- I was just going to go back a wee bit there, there Patrick, about uh, you were talking about Coleraine youth. I suppose you, you, you must yeah. have been keeping a wee close eye on, on the Coleraine youth team just recently who made it through to the yeah, their first yeah. Northern Ireland team, obviously made it through to the UEFA. Um, yeah, my be- my best mate played some of a few of them because I played with, that's kind of the ones I played all with growing up. So I sp- still speak to loads of them. Um, yeah, they beat that team from North Macedonia and then they went and played Genk. I think that was really good for them. I think, yeah, I think they were the first in Northern Ireland team to play on that, so that was good. Yeah, it must have been some experience for them. We're, we're, we're going to yeah, be yeah, um, chatting to their, their gaffer, Marty, Marty. Smith, yeah, next, yeah, next he, month. He coached, he coached me at uh, under-16s and never won the league, and then he was my county coach for Derry in the Milk Cup when I played in that about four years ago. So Very I've good. Worked with him twice, yeah. Um, but fantastic experience for them, you know, as well. I know, obviously, that they got a heavy defeat um, over the two legs, but they're, they're a pretty Genk strong team, good, though. But, yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. I see that they, they picked best. up. Yeah, they picked up some some really good results last season. And also, yeah. um, I, I was listening to a previous podcast. I think chatting to one of the Korean senior players was, was just saying about they used to sort of car share, or you were sort of car sharing with them, and um, yeah, yeah. And no doubt, I'm sure. I think it was was it with Lyndon Kane and, and a few yeah, others. That yeah, were it was me. Probably, are you going to yeah, say it was, who, it was you and a few others? Me, me, Lyndon, uh, James McLaughlin, and Ian Park at the start. So that was that was who our car share every week because Lyndon's from Corey and obviously then James and Park are from like just like we outskirt towns around mm-hmm. it. So us four travelled every Saturday. To games and stuff, so no, I was good crack in that car. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say it. I'm sure you, you yeah, grew up kind of quickly in that car. car. Yeah, I was weird because like Lyndon was like my idol whenever because he also he broke in the first time whenever like he was 17. Uh, so I think I was I think I'm six years younger than him, 17. So I was like 11 kind of when I was going to the games and stuff. Like, everyone looked up to him because he came from the academy into the first team. So then it was so weird to just be in like. Like he was, he he treated me as best mate last season. Like I'm still really close to him. Like we still speak all the time and stuff. And like every time I'm, every time I've been home, we've been out for food and stuff. So yeah, I'm still close to him. No, that's that's class. And you know, you're, you're obviously you were saying you were looking up to Lyndon. No doubt, there's there's a lot of Korean youth team players who are going to be looking up to you and seeing what you've done. And, yeah. You know, you're yeah. kind of going to be an inspiration for them. Yeah. And what about Oren Kearney? What's he like as a manager? Because he seems very calm and collected when he's interviewed sort of after games yeah. and um but you know has he is it is he you know would he give you the hairdryer treatment or is he sort of uh, very calm and collected before games half time after games or can he switch between um, the two he's a good man manager but, uh, yeah yeah that's the best thing about Owen. he's kind of he's got both like he's probably he's actually by far the best manager i've worked under like so far in my career but I think last season he didn't really get on to me as much because I was younger, but I have seen him flip a couple of times. I think he flipped at me once, so I learned last season in the first half because I, I gave the ball away a couple of times in a row and then he kind of went mad at me. And, but and then he apologised after and stuff. He said it was just like in the heat of the moment. But uh, he has he has went mad a few times, but it's just very good. Like man management, like he goes around individually each player before the game, just like telling them what he wants from that game, who they're playing against, and what position and stuff. And everyone expects from him, and even his training was unreal. I loved the training last year; that was class. Just the sessions he done, and he was just yeah, he was a great manager. Very good. And you know, going by what you said there, and you see even sometimes when when Korean are, are signing players, you know, quite often they're asked, well, you know, "Why are you signing for Korean?" They always kind of reference back to Lauren, Lauren Kearney that they yeah. want to play for him. You know, so he's he's, yeah, he's I, obviously I got something want, about him. I, yeah, I definitely want to play for him again. Happy days. So. Now to go on to West Ham. So, when was it? I suppose you were made known of interest because I'm sure there were quite a few clubs interested in you. You don't need to mention names of other clubs, yeah. but when were you known, or did you know about West Ham? And I suppose what way yeah. does it work? You know, do they do you have to go over there for trials, or is it just a matter of them kind of watching you and in, in your games for Korean? Uh, so it was kind of both. So I was offered a few trials at other clubs, uh, 
but Oren had always said he'd spoke to my mum and dad saying like if I was going it was I was there was no trials like just someone was signing me because he said like they could just come and watch me there was no need for a trial or anything so I think after the cup final last year at Windsor I started in it that was like quite a big game and stuff I think like a lot of, like most of the interest came in after that game and then I was in the team the rest of the season and I was playing I was playing well at the end of the season I got my own match a couple of games in a row and stuff and then I was told like before the Glens game at the end of last season I think it was like the third last game that there was like five teams there to watch me that day and I knew West Ham was one of them because Callum do Callum Marshall over here yes yeah He's a, he plays here and he told me like the week before that West Ham were asking him about uh, me and said they were going to watch me and stuff. So and then I played I played well that day to be fair and then just kind of after that it just all came through after or and it was actually my, my agent came down to my house. Uh, he just rang my dad and said he needed to speak with us and we knew it was quite urgent because he was coming down to the house and he lives like an hour and a half away from me. Uh, and then he just came down with the contract and stuff and he just said like West Ham had offered. And then just asked us what we thought of it and stuff like that. So yeah, it all just happened very quickly. But then I think I went away with Northern Ireland on the 19th in June. And then I was doing the medical just first week back from that. So and it all just happened. Fantastic. And apart from obviously West Ham being a, a massive uh, Premier League club, you know, was there other things? You knew a couple of fellas that were at West Ham, which which must have helped yeah. in terms of even settling in and them letting you, giving you a bit of a lowdown on the football club. But was there other things that stuck out for you, training facilities or, you know, West Ham are well known for giving young players uh, opportunities, you know, going back yeah. to me and Richie's days, like of Joe Cole and Rio Ferd yeah. or Frank Lampard yeah. and Cole, but there's been loads since. Yeah. Um, what what was the big selling point for you for West uh, Ham? Probably that, probably that one you just mentioned, let's say the pathway that there was, because just... Obviously, they invited me and my family over for like a look around before I decided where I was going to go because uh, they knew I had a few options. So they like invited my family over and they showed us around the house that I'm staying at a minute, the Diggs house and just how everything works. And then both training grounds and just kind of explained what like what they saw for me if I came to West Ham and stuff. And I think everything they just explained and the way everyone was around the club, like everyone was just so like kind, even from like every staff in the training grounds, just so nice and so down to earth. So I think. Like there was, and then obviously the reason you said about boys being here, I think that was one of the main reasons as well. Because I played with Calm and Michael growing up in Northern Ireland, so I knew both them really well. And then obviously Calm lives in the house, so I spend like I'm with him nearly every day. It's like looking at him, been with him every day for the last five months. Very good. And I've seen you pictured with Mark Noble as well. Obviously, he's a, yeah. a West Ham legend. Does does he give you a sort of? Was he giving you any words of wisdom? And what about David Moyes? Is, is, was he involved in the process at all, or even having a chat with you? Or yeah, yeah, I've had a chat with Moyes since I've been here in the in the first team gym. We went in, and he was he was in the gym, and he had a, he had a chat with me because I think his I think he has relations from Port Ross, which is like just I'm I'm from Port Stewart, so I think that's say right beside it. So he kind of and then there's a boy at Corian who's like on the board, and I think his cousin's David Moyes. So just chat with him about that, but how. He, he knew people from where I was from, and then obviously Mark Noble was there today. Sign, he's the new sporting director. I think he's taking over in January, and then like he's always about the training ground stuff, and he just always giving us advice. And then Darren Randolph was there that day, signed as well. So, uh, but now there's a lot of first team players in around like giving advice. Like I spoke to Declan Rice a few times as well. He's probably the biggest one I spoke to. So yeah, it's good. Unbelievable! That 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 is class. It, it must have been a. You know, you talk about it being surreal when you know you're playing for Korean first, and you know Lyndon Kane, your your idol. It must have been even more surreal when you're seeing, you know, some of those players that you're watching on on match of the day. Yeah. But I suppose within maybe a couple of weeks, it's just part of the norm, isn't it? Yeah, I think I was really like shell shocked at the start. I think the first time I trained with the twenty threes, uh, they train like on the pitch right beside the first team, and you're just you're just walking by all of them, just in the gym with them after, and just training right beside them. So it's yeah, it's a bit mental, but I think you get used to it. I think the first few weeks I was like, wow. And then after that, you just kind of get on with it. And, and take us through, like, a, it's just out of pure nosiness, because me and Rich these days, we're, we're, we're playing for over our local over 35 team, Oxford Sunnyside. So I think <laughs> I think the chances, nice Richie, what do you think of, of signing for a Premier League team is, pr- is pretty limited. Um, I still but... dream, Tops. I still dream. <laughs> <laughs> So out of pure nosiness, like what what is like a normal day for Patrick Kelly when you're waking up on on a Monday morning? You know, yeah. what times training? What do you have for breakfast? When does your day? And what do you do for the rest of the day? Yeah, 
Um, so, for example, like on a Monday, like today, uh, well, actually, I'm not used to today's example because they let us go home early because I'm normally playing at one, but if it was a normal one day... Well, flip sick, that's as easy. God, you'd love a yeah. job like that, wouldn't you? I just go... <laughs> Home early there, England playing. Have you to uh, pretend to be an England supporter then to get home early? Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> I, I told I told everyone I was supporting Iran, but uh, <laughs> so a normal Monday would be like wake up around half seven, quarter to eight, shower, go downstairs, uh, eat like a bowl of wheat or actually just any cereal, and then get get the bus to the training ground at about. Normally we're in for nine report, so normally leave the house at about half eight. Uh, like six of us leave the house at like half eight, go to training, and for nine, then uh, we have like optional breakfast again if you want like toast or anything at the training ground, and then we'll have a meeting at half nine, uh, and at the gym at ten for like about a bit of prep before training at half ten, then we'll train at half ten to twelve, lunch quarter past twelve, gym from about one to two, and then Monday we have education, so then we have education from around two to four. And then you just go back to digs or do whatever you want the rest of the day. So that's what most days look like. Education. Sorry, Cots, just to jump in. Tell us yeah. about that. Obviously, you're still a young man. Your career's in its infancy, as we said. What, yeah. what, what element of education are they offer? Uh, so it was different for me because I'd, I'd done A-levels because obviously I didn't get a move to England when I finished from GCSEs because obviously all that lockdown stuff, I wasn't really playing like fourth and fifth year. And then... Mm-hmm. Uh, I stayed at Loretto and done my A-levels last year, first year. So I'd done three A-levels last year and then obviously came here like halfway through them. So that was a bit weird. And then they offered that they could only like facilitate doing one. I wasn't able to can, like carry on all three. And then uh, I'd done history for the first week. And then I made my mum say that it was too much. So now I'm just doing what everyone else is doing, which is the, it's like a sport, sports and education course. So, it's the equivalent of three A levels, and you, we have it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. So Thursdays on the day we don't have it, and then it's two hours every day, then one hour on a Friday. So just a lot of assignments online, and then a lot of coaching stuff, and uh, yeah, just assignments and stuff like that. Brilliant, and then being being something you're interested in keeps you engaged with the with the education yeah, as yeah. well. And yeah, it ties it into actually your, your your real job, you know. Yeah, yeah. I guess what we're what we're learning about is kind of like all what we're doing and stuff. So, it's hand in off. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Hi, right, because that's a good point, Richie, about education. Because we we were chatting to at a previous podcast with a guy, uh, Sean Lavery, nicknamed Burba. He doesn't like it. Um. <laughs> it's, well, it it it, it it was it was more to do with his technical ability, wasn't it, Richie? He was called Burba, although he he didn't track back, but like Burba as well, but. He didn't have to because he was that good, but he was over at Leeds and he says about, you know, how education was, you know, pretty important um, and probably something he didn't have, you know, to, to kind of yeah, fall back they're on. Very big, they're very, very yeah. big about it over here, like they bang on that you need to, like they'd be angry if you didn't go or like you were late at the class or messing about in class or nothing, so like everyone just kind of takes it serious. And what about the football club as well? Do, do they play like an active role even sort of with? Like mental health things, you know, like especially yeah. for, for somebody like yourself going from Port Stewart to yeah. London, it must be a, a, a big culture health. shock. Yeah. And yeah, I know you're not a million miles away from home, but still, you know. Feels uh, like it. Yeah. Um, but it's great um, to see the things like WhatsApp and just yeah. uh, all these various apps that you can quickly link in with your mum and dad and stuff like that. But do they kind of give you that we support if you need it? And obviously as yeah. well with social media, which is huge. Yeah. yeah um, you know, do, do they give you lessons on social media, being careful, I suppose, what you say, and obviously trying to switch off from the noise if people are writing stuff or leaving you private messages or comments and stuff? Or yeah, is the club good in that way as well? I think that was one of the main differences I noticed about, obviously, Corian was part-time, so there's never going to be as many things going on as there's over here every day. Like, when you go into the training ground, there's about, there's about 100 staff, like, there's player care, welf- welfare, there's there's everyone you can imagine, like, staff, so they have ones to speak to for the ones that are away from home, and then they've, like, you go to them in their office if you ever have any issues or anything like that, so I've only had to go on, what I've, I was quite homesick at the start, to be fair, I, like, missing family and friends and stuff, but I think I tried to stay over here as long as I could before I went home, because obviously there's a few weekends where we can go home if there's no game, but uh, I stayed here, so I came on the 1st of July, and then stayed until right up the end of August it was the first time I went home, so I was here for a good two months, just trying to get used to it as much as I could. But I'm definitely settled in now, but I think I was very homesick at the start. Like, the first, first couple of weeks, I was bad. 
and then just got used to it after that. But I think I don't know how boys done it like back in the day with no like social media running. Because I think if I wasn't able to like communicate to my friends and all that way and, and family, if, I don't know how they done it. Yeah, because they, they, you know there's again going back to to Sean, he mentioned about the homesickness. Um, I know another couple of local players around the town as well struggle with it. Um, you know, so it's fantastic. Football clubs now are, you know, I've got these kind of support networks now, which which maybe weren't there maybe twenty years ago, um, which yeah. which is fantastic. So, and and fair play to you for opening up on that, you know. So because as you said, it must be a big culture shock. I know I kind of I mentioned it before, you know, about me going to Jordanstown. I even got homesick going to Jordanstown. Like it's only about an hour, like I yeah. said, digs there, and I couldn't wait till I got home come the the yeah. Wednesday and Thursday because the course was. The course I was doing, God, you would have been starting at nine and finishing maybe at about eleven o'clock, and you had your whole day basically doing nothing, you know. Um, yeah. So, but uh, so it's great. It's great that they have that, and even you, you know, you're a Liverpool fan. I don't know if you heard it, Richie Nunez. He was suffering from homesickness yeah. um, a lot in the first couple of months, and you know there are wee things yeah. that you, you you don't really, you obviously don't know about, and that could be a reason maybe why he wasn't. Maybe settling as quickly as he did those that first month or two, and then obviously he got the red card, which didn't help, and he was he was probably doing nothing for about a month. Do you know? But you say the culture shock and language, and you know, there's a whole lot of barriers that you have to get through before you feel feel at home. So up, I'm yeah. being a young man, maybe not having them life skills. You know, you're kind of learning on the job. Yeah, I think so London. You, you, you sort of you stick to your guns and come out the other end. You know. Yeah, London's very different to Port Stirling. As you said, the culture difference. It's just like so many different cultures around here. Like it's just mental from like walking about Port Stirling to walking about here. It's just night and day. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's nowhere in London that has like bars amusements. You know, there's one comes nah, close to it. Nah. <laughs> there's no bar or the anchor in Port Stirling. <laughs> <Nah. laughs> <laughs> that was an experience. Uh, back in the day, yeah. I don't, don't even know if it's still open. Um, oh, it's still, it's still a massive thing. Like, really. Oh, is it? Is it right? It yeah, is. Yeah, every Tuesday he, and Saturday. He, yeah. Well, here's the thing, boys. The boy that plays the, who, the Bonnevilles, basically, does the theme tune for this podcast. They were playing in the Anchor Bar this weekend. Oh, right. is that right? There you are. Yeah, right. they were indeed. Yeah. That's, that's a good link there, Richie. <laughs> that, that's a good link. Just, just to put it out there. You talk about Sean, Sean Lavery often enough, we may as well give Andy. <laughs> just right. <laughs> it is a good tune. Um, I was just going to ask you then, what about, you know, how would you assess then your first kind of uh, five, six months then at, at West Ham? Are you happy how things are going? And do you set yourself targets, what you hope to achieve by the end of the season? Or do you just take yeah. it, I know, an old cliche, game by game? Uh yeah, I think the first the first month I was here was a bit mad because we were away on tour the whole preseason. So they let me go because I used to play under eighteens over here. So I was away with under eighteens and under twenty threes. And my first month away, so I went to Portugal in the first week with the under twenty threes and a strain my quad on the third day. So I was out for a week and a half. I think just the difference in like the load of training because we were training like twice a day, and obviously I went from training two nights a week uh, last season to training like three times in one day. So I had strained my quad on like the third day, but then I was on there for like a week or so, and then I was back with the 18s. I uh, went to Scotland the next week, and then we played Rangers. That was my first game. We beat Rangers 5-1, and then we went to Czech Republic and played a tournament out there, and we got beat in the final, but that was a good tournament. I scored first goal and stuff and played well on it, so I think after that tournament, I was kind of settled in well. And then, so I actually like, haven't been here like four weeks. I hadn't really stayed in London yet. So then it was kind of until the end of August where I was settled in London, but no, I was training and stuff's going well. I've, I've been injury-free since that, so I'm enjoying it well. I love the training every day and stuff, and the games. We've started off the 18s have won 7 out of 7, uh, top of the league, so we have a big week coming up this week. We've got Arsenal Saturday, Chelsea Tuesday night, Spurs on the next Saturday, and then the FA Youth Cup the week after that, which is like the biggest competition. So we have loads of big games coming up, but we started really well, and then the 23s, I've been playing for them as well. They're, we started not so great in that league, but we've won our last three or four. We beat uh, Feyenoord all night in like a Premier League International Cup. So we're doing well in both edge groups at the minute. So yeah, it's all going good. Fantastic. So it sounds all, all good so far. Just just, just yeah. Liverpool is letting us down. 
Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really been able to watch Liverpool much because obviously we get tickets to every West Ham game. So I've been to every West Ham game this season. I've been to about 15, so I'm sick watching football. But I've barely, barely seen Liverpool at all this season. I've seen them a few night games I've been on, but just they've always been playing around the same time as West Ham. So just been to every West Ham game. Yeah. Games keeping you busy. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's to do. Yeah. Yeah. And and what about uh, as well? Just briefly touch on the Northern Ireland under 19s. Yeah, you um, obviously been going pretty well with them, and um, another excellent manager and Jared uh, Little. Little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was some experience that last camp. So we had my first time getting called back up again was March. We went to Benidorm and played a tournament out there, and then like our, our edge groups are quite special. We're we're very good. Like uh, we always have been. We beat. Uh, Beat Norway, drew with Belgium, and beat Czech Republic in that tournament. And then I think we had a camp in June in Malta. We beat them twice, and then we had the Euros in September, Euro qualifiers, where we beat beat Moldova to qualify, drew with Holland, and uh, drew with Slovakia to each. So that's us into the late stages now, and the draws done next month. I think that was like that's probably been the highlight of my career so far. That was like our biggest. That was my biggest moment so far. Cause I scored two in the first game against Slovakia. And it was just unbelievable scenes. Like even whenever we, whenever we qualified, it was so funny because we thought we were out in goal difference because like everyone was shouting we needed another goal, and then we didn't get a goal, and then everyone thought we were out, and then we were all kind of standing at the dugout. Everyone looked so sad, and then our physio had his phone out, and then he had shouted we were through, and then everyone just started going mental, and then everyone was out at night party, and the coaches, everyone was out. It was mad. Fantastic. Been for everybody, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just say yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you must have a quiet time with all these places you're going to. <laughs> no, I'm still, well, to be fair, I have to I have time to bet since I came here, but I'm starting to go away about now. Are <laughs> you stamps on your passport? Yeah, yeah, I've been fuck, I've been there everywhere around Europe. Uh, t- last question before we go on to keep you up, please, unless Richie has a couple of questions, but uh, completely unrelated. What do you think if uh, see Richie used to manage me and I went to watch a Liverpool game? Now I was in the team every single week. <laughs> I just no, I just I just want to hear Patrick's view. Was it harsh? Went to watch Liverpool. I think we played Fulham and finished nil. It was an awful match. I came back. Richie dropped me from the squad. Mid-season. We're going to watch Liverpool. Mid-season. Well, what do you think of that, Patrick? Being a Liverpool fan, uh, was it harsh? Uh, like from the squad. Did you miss a game or did you miss training? I, I missed. Oh no, it was always a train. I just met, I missed a game. I gave him plenty of notice going to Liverpool match. Drop me from the squad. That's well, I think like would Orkney do that? Would he? Yeah. Would he? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think. Well, I think if they won <laughs> the game, I think if they if they won the game and the person that he replaced you played well, then he would obviously have to keep him in. But I do get what you mean by going to see Liverpool because that's it, once in a lifetime. Yeah, yeah, but from the squad, like, 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 yeah, yeah. from the squads, maybe a bit too a harsh. Far. Yeah, wasn't it? <laughs> but, I, mean, I think was Walsh got a call up that weekend hospital. Oh, was that the last time you went to go to Liverpool? <laughs> it was actually. It was. <laughs> I think that's what he was. Yeah, I, I, the last that was in who was manager then? I think it was your. So I, I think that was two thousand and four, and it only went back to another Liverpool match there last year. So yeah, that's uh, the Richie done. Since... He's ruined all those special moments they could have had <laughs> watching Liverpool. I was afraid to go again because I didn't want to be dropped. <laughs> so it worked, Richie. Pardon? It worked. It worked. Sure, yeah. Man. I got a game that week as well, so it was, <laughs> it was handy that you actually left. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the you. your your keepy uppies, Richie? How do yes, you... have you been doing your homework? Yeah, I think Patrick, I think I have. Yeah, did you get a look? There's a few I've been like stuck in because like there's so many options. Is it like, is it played? Is it players are played with or against? It's either or. It's entirely up to you. You're basically just, giving these boys a shout out. I might just go with because I think bringing against under it would just be too confusing because there's so many to pick from. Cause... No problem at all. No problem yeah. at all. Say so, yeah, this is your chat. Yeah. We'll kick on straight away then. Straight in with the best team you've ever played for. And there's only been two. <sighs> Uh, Corian. Well, there's, there's the band right. cider Bambino, so what's it all about? Are they not good? No. Uh, no, well, that, that was Corian. That was, that was like a wee, that was like, whenever you were that age, that was the only thing you could join before Corian started, so 
that was like a wee camp yeah. in Corey, and then I just went from that to Corey. And so, yeah. We have them here at Oxford Sunnyside. They're called the Little Stars. Uh, yeah, I used to remember playing yeah. against Oxford Sunnyside when I was younger. There you go. There you go. Connections there. Brilliant. All right, so best captain? Uh, Stephen O'Donnell. Tell us about Stephen. He was just very good, especially whenever I came in the core rings, I was so young, he like, he always like put his arm around me and made sure I was alright for every game and stuff, and like, uh, he was quite like a vocal captain, so he would just kind of shout at everyone during the game, like, good stuff and bad stuff, he would like shout at you when you needed to, and he would just make sure, he was just really professional, like he would just make sure everyone was training at their best and all, and no one was kind of mucking about or not trying, or like thinking they were better than the team running, right so that's probably why he's the best captain. Brilliant. All right, another two here. I'll throw at you. Best goal scorer and best touch. Best goal scorer, uh, I'll go with Cal Marshall, boy at West Ham. He's definitely the best goal scorer I've played with. Uh, well, I could say Matthew Shevin as well. But I'll go, I'll go, uh, I'll go Cal Marshall. And best touch, I would say Liam McStravick, Limfield. All right. All right, so here's your, your effectively a favorite side here. So your best keeper, best defender, best midfielder, and best striker. Best keeper, Garth Dean. Best defender, Lyndon Keane. Best midfielder, Stevie Lowry. And best striker. That's a tough one. Uh, the other ones are all way easier. Probably go. Curtis Allen. Not a bad player. Or play it. Maybe, maybe not when player. I I know he was at the end of his career whenever I played him, but just like in general of what he's like the amount of goals he scored in the league and stuff. He's probably the best striker I've played with. Brilliant. All right, then best left foot and best right foot. Um best left foot I would say Josh Carson at Corian. And best right foot I'll go Jimmy Glagan. No, no uh no left footed ones or, or Hoovers this week, Pat. <laughs> you ever heard of that one, um, Patrick? Left left foot on you like a Hoover. That was somebody threw that in a podcast, and me and Richie were like, "What? Never heard of that in my life." <laughs> no, I've never heard of that. Uh, the one, maybe, but maybe not a Hoover. No, not a Hoover. All right, brilliant. So, uh, best manager. I think Warren you did touch on it. Yeah. And go again. Oren Kearney. Repeat what you said about him. Let, let us know what what's what 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 is it that's special about Owen? Uh, I think just well for me, just the way he like he's he's just just as nice as a person as he is like a manager that like, he speaks to you like he's like your friend. Just the way he spoke to you before a game, he just like especially for me like at the start, I think the main worry I had was just playing with confidence, and he just made sure like especially towards the end of the season, he just like he just kind of let me like play the way I wanted to play, and he just gave me confidence, and then. Like his man management, the way he spoke to people before the game and stuff, just like, telling them what he expected of them and his team talks were very motivating, like at half time stuff, whenever we were losing or needed a goal or I think he was just I think he was just everything that we had they couldn't have a bad word to say about him. Brilliant. Was he a bit of a hugger? Yeah. Good. Nice guy, nice guy then. Yeah. Goes a long goes a long way to be nice, but then yeah, he does, already yeah. said when he needs to be when he needs to be mean, he can be mean as well. Yeah, yeah, I think all managers back, have to be. Back. Absolutely. All right, uh, player that loves a hard challenge. Um, I'll go Jamie McDonald. He plays in the Northern Ireland 19 team. He's at Nottingham Forest. He's the young. We all call him Roy Keane. Oh, brilliant! On the same path. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, quickest player. Quickest player. Hmm. Arm Whiteman, maybe. Glenn Torn. All right. Uh, two more. Best all round player and player that got better with age. Best all round player. Uh, uh, probably say. Hmm. It's a tough one, that. Um, I would go with, do you know Charlie Lindsay now? Charlie Lindsay, do you know him, Todd? Yeah, Best no, Avengers. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd probably say him going yeah. up. He was always the best played with. And then, uh, player that got better with age. I 
I won't say Stevie Larry, but I think he was unreal when he was younger as well, so I don't know if I can say him. But go Stevie Larry, yeah. Alright, last last question to keep you up is and then Tats will spin that wheel of Berba. Yeah. So the player who always gave a hundred percent or gives a hundred percent. The player who always gives a hundred percent. Uh George Carson. The last season definitely he was like at least an eight out of ten every week, no matter what. Like, you know, I've never seen him play ball. Alright, brilliant. Make sure you like and tag and share and all these guys whenever yeah, we publish Yeah. Yeah. You tilt the hat to them all. Oh, brilliant. Alright, I'll pass you back to Tots where he spins his uh, imaginary wheel of Berba. I'll tell you, you get a good favour say team out of some of those players. Yeah, couple of good yeah, favourite yeah. teams, some some brilliant. Uh, yeah, because I was I was trying to just keep it the ones that you know mainly from Irish league at like Corey and stuff, but also there's ones over here that I've played with that are very good as well. And then when I was younger, but I was just trying to keep it more like ones that you'd know as well. Yeah, fantastic. And what about Oren Kearney as well? Would he be? Um, would he give you a lot of sort of? You were you were talking there about him giving you a lot of confidence. Like, how did he do that? Or did did it, you know? Did he give you a bit of freedom on the pitch to? You know, yeah. to do what you wanted to do, or was he big into yeah. tactics as well? Or he wasn't. He wasn't overly into tactics. I think that's why he's like different. Because like I think some managers are too into like tactical and having like playing footballs of its like statues. And Orm was just kind of like, especially for me at the end of the season, he was just like telling me to like just get on the ball and just play the way I was playing and training and just go and do what I want. He didn't really like tell me to play a certain way. He just said like whenever I got the ball, it's up to me to do what I see and just do whatever I want to do whenever I got it so I think he just like let me kind of do what I want fantastic yeah um, so we're going to spin the wheel of Berber so it's going to um, just spin in a way here so I'm just waiting that it stops and it's going to stop on some hot topic of debate and you're just going to give us yeah. your, your view on it so it's just stopped here and it's regarding the World Cup um, who do you think is going to win the World Cup and why? Uh, I know it's still early days, but who do you fancy for the competition and why? Um, I think, well, I want Argentina to win it because I'm a big Messi fan and I want Messi to go out as the best. So I know, I know where that is, but I think I would just definitely say that would be it because some people still think Ronaldo's better, which amazes me. Like, but uh, So I think Argentina have a good, I would say between Argentina and Brazil, but I'm going to go Argentina just because I think they haven't lost a game in like four, three or four years. And I think Matt is in really good form, so yeah, I'm hoping they win it. I think they could. You think they'll do the business? Yeah, well, I think I think they're are they the favourites? I think they might be up there. I think it's that them in Brazil. I think yeah, it's just Brazil, Brazil yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting as well. Somebody made a good point to me the other day, Richard. I don't know what you think about the World Cup. I still find it odd, obviously, it being played mid-season, but actually, that yeah. it it might work out in an advantage for maybe some of the teams that actually instead of somebody like Messi having a long season um, and then playing a World Cup mid-season. Yeah, they were you know, he's still going to be fairly right? fresh, yeah. 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 So it, it, it yeah, might... 100%. They're coming, they're coming in on the peak of their powers. Yeah, yeah I'm not, I think it's... A, a long season. This World Cup, there's so much like drama around it. Like, I just I don't really care about it. Like, I think it's just forget about it all. Just, like, just care about the football. There just seems to be so much going on about like everyone else. Everyone's yeah, just, that's like, the yeah, thing. No one's really talking about the football at all. Everyone's just talking about like everyone else. I was glad to see the first game kicked off that they can actually yeah. concentrate on the football. Yeah, yeah. There is issues there that need discussed, but you know, yeah. football's not the and politics aren't supposed to mix. Nah, like, they're trying to dam this to mix. Nah, like they knew that was going to happen whenever they took out the guitar. Like they have all their own rules. So I don't know why everyone's complaining about it that they yeah. should change it. Like because they're not going to change it. Well, as we sit here, Wales have just scored. In yeah, I said that. Nah, 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 just, just about to say, yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, who scored? Bale. Who scored for? I know. Who scored for Wales? I don't know. Gareth Bale. Gareth oh, Gareth Bale! Didn't hear that. I thought you said Wales scored. Aye, uh, Gareth Bale. Happy days, right? When we yeah. get uh, what, what minutes are on? Eighty-five. Ah, oh, eighty-four. Uh, 85. Uh, I'm strange streaming mine in the dodgy box, so it's eighty-four <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so it could be over then if you're if you're. You should, should you be saying that you're you're nah. on the dodgy box, Richie? In case anybody's <laughs> listening here. Well, there are 155 listeners <laughs> one <laughs> So there you so, are. Pat, who's your who's your tip for the World Cup? Um, to be honest, I, I think it's going to be between Argentina and Brazil as well. Myself, uh, Spain. I 
still think it's a wee bit early for them. Germany's probably still in transition. England, I, I don't think they're going to win it, but I could see them reaching the latter stages. Yeah, I think they'll get around semis and then yeah. hopefully get pumped by Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm hoping it's going to be Argentina. I think it might be Brazil. Yeah. That's and I just think around, England's think. the dark horses as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think we realised recently the romance in football is limited. You know, yeah. Steven Gerrard, uh, Frank Lampard, all these fairy tale things happening and it never works out. So here's a wish and I hope that Messi wins the World Cup and as yeah. he's rightly declared the best ever, but let's see. That's yeah, it. I just think I was I watching England, England there and England I just don't think spoil they've, his party. I just think I they've got a nice good. wee shape, you know, whereas you talk about yeah. Gerrard and Lampard, there were so many some brilliant players in that in that uh, squad, but there were more individuals. Whereas you kind of look at Dakin yeah, Rice yeah. just sitting in front of the back four and batting them, and he was pushing it on and Mount kind of slotting in the midfield. They look good at times. I know they're up against Iran, yeah, but they, still, they look you know, good, yeah. there are games they've struggled in in the past and they kind of want to comfortably. Yeah. But anyway, hopefully Argentina. Fingers crossed. Fingers and toes. Yeah. Fingers and toes. Patrick, so, even inside line with Dakin Rice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can you can you get him to sign for Liverpool and ask Bellingham <laughs> to join him? <laughs> oh, I don't think there's any chance of both of them, but hopefully we can get one of them. So I know West Ham fans will be devastated if they left, but I think yeah, I don't know. I think could do in the next couple of years, but we'll see. I think Bellingham would be better. I might well, I would take either to be honest, but yeah, yeah. No, I, Bellingham I think is more realistic. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say that Richie try and get Declan Rice on the podcast. And then I'm thinking, how does he well, fit in? We're supposed too. we're supposed to be celebrating the local game, but then he he was Irish before, so he, you know, kind of technically, he used, yeah, he used to be Irish. Might so. qualify for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's sick. Absolutely, get him in. Mark Noble as well, right? Yeah. And David Moyes, he's got family in Northern Ireland. Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> how to make friends and influence people. <laughs> Well, here, thanks a million, Patrick, for for taking the time out. And no problem. Thank I'm you. Sorry for, for missing the Wales match. I, I didn't no, even no, realize. Right. I've, I'm bored of watching football. Today. I've watched two games already, and then I'm off tomorrow, so I'll probably watch Argentina play at ten. You're off so. tomorrow. You got the day off. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the first week they've had off since I've been there. It's just because the under seventeens had a cup game, which makes up like half of our team at the minute. Because obviously the 23s have stopped because the Premier League 2 stopped with the World Cup. So everyone's back down playing their own age group under 18s. Uh, and the under 17s have a game tomorrow. So all the ones that are under 18 are just have tomorrow off. And then we're to go to the game in the evening. They're playing Colchester, I think, in the Cup. So it's going to go to that game tomorrow evening. Wow. It really sounds like you're living the dream, Patrick. Best of yeah. luck Yeah, thank best you. Luck you. Yeah, and all the best with everything. Um, yeah, you know you've you've got the clearly got the right attitude and the right determination. You've come through a, a wee tricky patch the first couple of months, so it's it's onwards and upwards for you. Yeah. So all the best, and again, thanks a million for for coming on to the podcast. No problem, thank you. All right, you're officially a new football friend. So say yeah. reach out to Declan and, and David Moyes and get, get <laughs> well them on for a shot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, take care, Patrick. Take care. You too. See you all the best. You take it easy. Bye bye. But keep the uppies with Richie and Tots. Mm-hmm.